Thank you very much, Paul. Yeah, let's get into it. So this is about uh, cultivating creativity. And uh, I, I love to start with this quote because I think, and I'm going to focus primarily on cultivating individual creativity, how you change yourself. And, um, I, I, you know, maybe not turn yourself into a creative person, but realize uh, more about the creative person that you already are. Um, there's some analogies to personal creativity and organizational creativity. You can apply these same principles to groups, um, but I'm going to talk primarily about the individual, and uh, we can talk about how you apply it later uh, when we get to questions. But so that I start with this quote: "The real voyage of discovery lies not in seeking new landscapes, but in having new eyes." So we're we're um, you know we're committed to the notion that everybody is individually creative. Um, some people may have a natural uh, ability to um, manifest that creativity easily. Others may, may not feel they have that. But uh, we know from our work uh, with thousands and thousands of students that we can awaken um, creativity in almost any, uh, any individual. Um, and that comes to the thing that really is the foundation for the, the D school, we call it, uh, and this notion of design thinking. Uh, David Kelly, who's the founder of IDEO and also um, the founder of the, the D School, the and, and a senior faculty here now for almost 40 years, um, you know, said that design thinking is essentially at its core. Design thinking is all about unlocking potential and creating creative confidence in our students. And um, we've been doing this uh, in the design program since uh, 1963. Um, we've been doing it at the D School since 2005. This notion of taking the methodologies that were originally developed in the fields of product design and service design, but applying them to a, the larger issue of um, organization, strategy, and in our case uh, today, personal creativity. Um, David's got a great TED Talk that you can uh, refer to if you're interested in seeing um, him present the information. And then just recently, and I think maybe six months ago, the David and his brother Tom, who also works at IDEO, um, created uh, uh, their, a book on this subject called Creative Confidence, Unleashing the Creative Potential Within All of Us. And we like this idea of creative confidence, like that, that you would feel um, that you have the ability to solve problems, think outside of the box, and do things um, in, in, a, in the creative realm that in maybe in the past you thought only artists or designers or whatever, whoever you thought creative people were, um, only they could do these things. And it turns out that that's not true. We have tons and tons of evidence both from the field of psychology and from the field of uh, design and certainly from our own educational um, offerings here at Stanford in the D School that we can turn on the creative confidence in almost anyone. So. Just to give you a little bit of background on this notion of design thinking, you know, we've been teaching design for a long time here at Stanford, um, but we were very interested in kind of how, to, how could you teach this, this methodology, this idea of thinking like a designer um, to anyone? Because everybody's got to solve problems. Uh, everybody's got to, you know, solve problems in their daily life, solve problems in their organization. Um, and so uh, in the early part of 2004, 2005, the faculty sort of took a step backwards and said, what is this really all about? What makes the process of thinking like a designer to solve a problem different from, say, the process of thinking like an engineer or thinking like a business person? And we extracted these principles that design thinking is both the process and, some, and, and kind of a way of thinking. So the process is quite simple. Um, we don't start with a problem. We start with a person. We don't start with, let's go design a new wheelbarrow. We start with, um, you know, I'm stepping back and trying to look at um, the whole issue of, you know, in case of wheelbarrows, you know, construction folks on a job site who need to have materials when they need them, and what's that all about? And so we go out and we start with empathy. We do a deep dive on the human situation and develop, even before we've developed the hypothesis or the question we're trying to, to solve, we, um, uh, we take whatever the focal question is at the start, pretty much throw it away and just go talk to the people who are involved in the problem. And then we define or really redefine the problem, which is where we have a big, you know, kind of a bunch of tools about reframing problems. Most of the time, 
uh, I find in, in my own consulting practice and practice with uh, companies who come to Stanford, they say, hey, we want to we want to we want to get out of the box and we want to think really bigly and big. And then the problem they present is actually a solution. You know, how do we design better wheelbarrows? A wheelbarrow is a solution, not a not a problem. So we do a redefine, and then we do a lot of stuff in the ideation part of the project. And we're going to hit on one topic here in ideation because it's a thing people say they do, but they don't really do well. Um, but having lots of ideas, if you have lots of ideas, you can choose from a much better pool of ideas. And then our process is essentially um, a prototype and test, prototype and test process. And the prototyping in this uh, in this design thinking framework isn't this, it's a, we're using the term very specifically, not the generic notion of building a model of something you know that you want to that you want to um, produce, um, because we can prototype an experience, we can prototype a service, we can prototype a product, we can prototype a strategy, but it's not to be uh, a solution, it's to be a good question. And then we go out and test with the people that we had empathy for. So it's a, it's a very interesting process. It's not this linear, of course. We can start at any part of the process. We can, you know, and we loop back often after we've built some things and tried them with people. We, re, we loop back and realize our original definition was incorrect or not quite precise. And so uh, a, a feature of design thinking is that we know we don't know. Uh, and so we start with people. We redefine problems. And then we have this highly... Um, circular process of sort of building our way forward into a solution. Um, the former president of um, Ford, Alan Malahi, used to say, um, culture eats process for lunch. You can have any kind of process you want, but if you don't have a design thinking or a creative culture, the processes won't result in uh, innovative solutions. And so we really think, even if you don't think about our design process starting with empathy and ending with you know prototyping think about our mindsets the mindsets of radical collaboration the great ideas come from groups of people who do not share common backgrounds they're not it's not just a radical collaboration is not getting six engineers from six different divisions together because that's all engineering thinking it's truly a radical collaboration of people from all over the organization reframing problems um, really, design thinking it, 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 at its most powerful is about problem finding, not about problem solving. And so the ability to look at problems in a unique way and having methods to do that is critical. Um, mindful of process, because as I said, this, you, know, we don't, you can start anywhere in that process diagram, and sometimes it gets very confusing, and you're not sure exactly what you're, what, where, where you are in the process of resolving a problem or designing a new thing. And so it's good to be going back constantly and checking to see that you know, you're staying in the process of creativity. A bias to action, we don't spend a lot of time doing analysis. Uh, we'll build prototypes you know, long before most organizations would even think you know, that they're ready. We don't do a lot of specification, market requirements, documents, and things like that. This is, again, an idea finding, problem finding you know, phase of a program. Um, and we tend to build um, to think. So it's a big bias to action. And it all comes from this, we're deeply curious about the people we're designing for. In the case of ourselves and trying to make ourselves more creative, I think it's easy to be deeply curious about how your brain works and how you get stuck and where you, uh, where you might be able to move forward in a more creative way if you just had a slightly different framework uh, to work inside of. And so we're going to apply design thinking now to ourselves and talk about you know, personal creativity. We're in, so we're in the ID8 bubble, or the ID8 hexagon of this process, and we're talking about um, this, this notion of creativity, personal creativity. And you know, a lot of times when people come to me, they just say, I'm not creative. You know, I was never one of the creative kids in high school. I didn't take art, or I wasn't a musician. And they, they kind of attach creativity to some special trait or talent that they think they don't have. And they've turned creativity into some kind of a problem. I'd like to unpack that and probably resolve that uh, if I can for you right now. So uh, this isn't a poll. You can sort of silently ask yourself, gee, was I more creative when I was a child? I think, think to yourself back when you were six or seven, you know, first grade, preschool, first grade, 
and you're playing on the playground, and you could turn a stick into a rocket ship, and you could turn a rock into a castle, and you, you know, I mean, you had this ability to just imagine a world in a very open-ended and creative way. And most people, when I talk in the in the class about this, they say, yeah, you know, there was something, and then talk about curiosity, I was curious about everything. I had a really open and, and engaged way of, of being in the world. And whether you were an extrovert or an introvert, I was a big introvert as a child, but I could play, you know, by myself with just objects I found in the world um, and turn them into, um, you know, complete environments. So most people think they were this way, and the question is why? why you know, if you were that sort of a creative child, what happened? Um, and, and here's what happened. Um, uh, first, education, um, which, which devalues uh, creativity and overvalues um, kind of command and control. Most schools are designed around controlling kids, not educating their creative processes, because creative kids do things that don't follow the rules. And therefore, um, you learn pretty quickly as soon as you started engaging institutions that being different or daydreaming or, or imagining things um, that weren't uh, on the schedule of the teacher were really not received uh, in a very positive way. Um, and the other thing that was true is that as, as, um, as humans evolved, um, there's this notion of neural Darwinianism, which is the idea that the brain has evolved through resource competition to operate you know, in the body um, competing for energy from all the other body, bodily systems. So you consume about 2,000 calories a day, roughly, so average human, about 2,000 calories. That's the energy input. And it turns out your brain takes 500 of those calories. 25% of the energy that you consume every day just goes to running your brain, which is a huge amount. The brain is only 2% of your body mass, and it's consuming 25% of the energy. Um, so if it consumed probably any more energy than that, it would, uh, you know, then the rest of the body couldn't function. So over time, you've evolved this very efficient but very power-hungry brain. The brain operates on about 40 watts, which I've always found it to be a startling statistic because, you know, your, lap, your modern laptop is about 80 or 100 watts, and, you know, if you've got a reasonable desktop computer, it's 400 or 500 watts. And, Watson, the computer that won the Jeopardy challenge, is 250,000 watts. And Watson can't write a poem, and it can't fall in love, and it can't paint a painting. It, I mean, it's just a, you know, uh, my favorite uh, Picasso quote is, computers are useless because all they can give you are answers. Um, and your brain is such an amazing mechanism for asking these interesting questions. But it has to compete for energy with the rest of the body. So it has evolved to be one of the most efficient processors on the planet. We have no idea how to build a 40-watt processor. We have no idea how, how to build a processor that can do what the brain does in general. But we're off by 100 orders of magnitude in terms of the efficiency of the brain. Now, that efficiency comes with a couple of problems. One of the problems is the brain can't uh, respond to all of the stimulus that it's seeing all of the time and still only operate in 40 watts. So this is a model of the brain comes from Donald Norman and Dan Goleman. The, uh, Dan's the emotional intelligence guy. Don Norman's a, a cognitive psychologist who's also written a bunch on design. But this is why you're, this is the box, and this is why you're in the box. You kind of, everybody kind of thinks, well, I see the whole world, and then I process everything, and then I do what I do. I have some unconscious responses and conscious responses, and that's the whole thing. But it turns out it's not nothing like that at all. The way we have now mapped the way the brain processes information is that you, you know, the, your eyes, your ears, your, your physical body, you know, kinesthetic knowledge, the visual knowledge, the auditory stuff that's coming in, that all gets sort of censored uh, a little bit. Um, it gets uh, uh, filtered into uh, things that the brain can process. And then it's sort of thrown up into, you know, the unconscious processing of the brain and into short and long-term memory. And everything is organized into simple schemas. You know, there's this notion that there's a grandmother neuron, that one neuron fires when you see your grandmother. It's not quite true, but it's kind of true. You know, when you see people that you don't know, you have to process lots of information about their faces. But your, your best friend, your mom, somebody that you've seen hundreds of times, really only activates a small number of neural paths to provide the recognition. So the brain rapidly schematizes data. And that's so that it can process information in as low as possible energy state. And what you're actually aware of turns out to be one 
100,000 of the data that's being processed. And it's actually organized for you in this little, this little part of the brain that's called pre-consciousness or pre-conscious um, uh, prediction. And that part of the brain is what you're actually conscious of. You're conscious of all the things that you see, but they've been schematized into very simple formats, and you're conscious of what you think is going to come next. So it turns out, I don't know if you've seen the video, um, of, there's a video that, that sort of demonstrates how attention filters information. Um, it's a video that's up on up the Internet. You can find it's um, a bunch of people, you're asked to count the people passing basketballs, and there's a white team and a black team, and you count the basketball passes of the white team, and if you pay it, real attention to that, you can actually figure it out. They're moving around a lot. It's kind of complicated, but it's, I think, that's 36 passes is the right number. Um, but while attending to that, you fail to notice that a man in a gorilla suit has walked across the middle of the, of the video, waved at the camera, and walked away. About 50 or 60 percent of the people who concentrate on the video and get the correct answer do not see the gorilla. And that's because our information systems are chunking things down into schemas and only looking at what we think is going to happen or what we've been asked to observe. And so the psychologists have come up with this notion that we don't really see what we're looking at. It's all, the data is all there, it's an unconscious processing, but we only are aware of and we only see what we're looking for. Then the other interesting piece of data about your brain is that consciousness, this awareness that we have that attends to things, it's really only 300 minutes, so less than a half a second. Um, we know this because uh, we've mapped sort of short and long-term memory as the two processes that allow us to construct the world. And there have been people who have had, unfortunately, a brain tumor or a lesion or some kind of a, a surgery which has disconnected their long-term memory functions. And they only have about a seven or eight minute um, awareness of the world. That's as long as their world lasts. There was a pretty famous movie called Memento uh, about a guy who had this condition. And so, unfortunately, there's also been people who have lost both their long and short-term memory, and we know that their ability to, you know, kind of process and remember things, this, this pure consciousness is less than a half a second. So why am I telling you this? Well, because what it turns out then is that although we think we have this direct view of objective reality, the truth is that we're putting reality together almost like the frames of a movie, little 300 millisecond frames tossed into short-term memory, schematized, and then re repeated back to us so that we know what to look for, the things that are important. But the things that our brain has told us to look for are just the things that we um, expect to see. And so we're kind of making up a video game here. And it's, and it's sort of, in some ways, a little depressing to think that I'm not actually seeing the whole world and, and um, that uh, my, my perceptions are highly uh, filtered and that I'm really only seeing what I'm looking for. Um, but actually, there's a positive in all that. Let me take you to one more piece of data, and then we'll pull it all together. Uh, there are tests that you can that, that the psychologists have sort of validated that demonstrate sort of a natural creativity in people. And research on people who rate high on these tests, highly creative people, reveals that they have three completely different they have three things that are different about them. And this is different in the sense that we put them in an fMRI scanner, we're scanning their brains, we're asking them to do creative tasks. They're completing those tasks. Then we take, quote, normals, and we scan their brains. And we say, what's the difference? What's, what's going on in the brain that's different? Research on creative people reveals three things. One, they per actually perceive the world differently. When, when shown visual things or given tactile things to touch, their brain lights up in a much more um, holistic way. The left and right brain is more active than in a normal person, a normal, normal person versus creative person. They also have a high social awareness response. They have a high empathy response. Now, oftentimes, very creative people are introverts. Think of artists and scientists and, and uh, you know, computer programmers who are said to be very creative or at the top of their field. They're oftentimes introverts. So this is not an introvert-extrovert thing. This is just so they, they have a real uh, a sort of an extra um, emotional response to the world. And the third thing is they have what's called, what psychologists call the low fear response to novelty. And this is, by the way, from a book uh, by Gregory Burns on, on neuroscience and creativity. This low fear response to novelty 
is really interesting because what it is is that when shown something that should, you know, because it's new and it's different, it should cause your amygdala to light up and some, some stress hormones to flow, it doesn't happen. They, it's actually, there's actually a part of their brain that does not function correctly. Um, and fear response to novelty is, um, is necessary. Evolution would probably design it in to, our, you know, to individuals and to groups because um, if you're afraid of, you're appropriately afraid of things that jump out at you in the forest and you don't know what they are, then you won't get eaten. And if we are all afraid of the same things, we're a more cohesive tribe, and so we stay together. So uh, creativity uh, would have been, you know, sort of bred out in an evolutionary sense, except that it's important to have a few people left in the tribe who are creative because when the situations change, they can respond in a creative manner. And this is the basis, of, really, of David's book, that low fear response to novelty can be learned. Uh, Albert Vendora, a psychologist here at Stanford, studied phobias, and people who are terrified of snakes or terrified of, of spiders or terrified of flying and um, developed a protocol, which he called Guided Mastery, which uh, allowed people to move away from these fear responses and, and actually master them so they could actually pick up a snake or hold a spider in their hand or get on an airplane. And when put it back in a brain scanner, had no, no fear response. So it's a, it's a set of neural paths that you can train. And that's the great news, that one, you can learn this, and that two, um, that you can take advantage of the box. We're in a box, it's true. We have these schematic ways of thinking. We only see what we're looking for, but that's, that's I would argue, this a liberating idea. Everybody's in a box, so don't feel bad. There's nothing wrong with you. Um, your brain works just like everybody else. Two, brain, creativity is probably a brain deficit. It's not something special that you, weren't, that you were born with and you have this extra part of your brain. It's actually something that doesn't work, and we know how to turn off the part of your brain that works well, so that's, a good, that's, that's good news. Um, creativity is a very high-energy brain behavior. Brains like to operate at 40 or 20 or 10 watts if they can. It's not normal, but you can train your brain to do these kinds of behaviors. And so these things can be learned, and if you, it's just three things. In personal creativity, low, learn to lower your fear of failure. Learn to lower the fear of the novel. Because if you want to do something unusual and creative, it will, by definition, be scary. Learn. Since your brain manipulates your attention through this schematic uh, uh, mechanism, learn to manipulate the schemas. That's why we often, in brainstorming sessions, say something like, what if you were an elephant? How would you solve this problem? What if there were no gravity? How would you solve this problem? All we're doing is changing what's in your preconscious loader to predict what's coming next. We're asking for unusual predictions. But you can train yourself to change the way you look for information. And you can access your other intelligences. There's emotional intelligence, kinesthetic intelligence, and I'm going to talk specifically about this sort of what I'm going to call improvisational intelligence, the ability to create in the moment. Okay, so all these things are learnable, and, and they're learnable with the brain you've got. You didn't, you, nothing wrong with what you got. So we're, we're talking about ideation. First rule, train yourself to get stuck. Now, this sounds kind of funny, like why would I want to get stuck? Um, I want to be more creative, I don't want to be stuck. But uh, you've got to learn to be stuck if you want to learn to have the aha moment, the aha moment that comes right after being stuck. Paul mentioned that we did a workshop down in Mexico and it was actually for a bunch of financial um, services executives. And one of the bankers came up to me at halfway through the workshop and said, you know, I hear, all you, I hear what you're saying, and it all sounds really good. He says, but I, I'm not creative. I said, why aren't you creative? He says, well, because I just get stuck. I got stuck on the first problem, and then I couldn't solve it. I got stuck on the second problem. And I said, well, getting stuck is not the problem. I get stuck all the time. I mean, designers take on problems. They've never – I get stuck ten times a day. So getting stuck isn't the issue. It's how do you get unstuck, right? There's an exercise in Jim Adams' conceptual blockbusting that I use a lot called 30 circles. And it's a wonderful little exercise. You basically just put 30 circles on a page and try to make the circles into something. That's all the instructions. And people make up their own rules, and they get stuck, and they run out of ideas, and they, they have all these sort of you know, coping behaviors when they feel bad about themselves. Uh, and we're able to walk them through that process, and almost everybody goes from 
being stuck and then having a little aha moment where they realized a new way to solve the problem. And so if, we can, if you can train yourself to notice when you're stuck and then use the methods that Jim talks about in his book about how you get unstuck, um, you can, can trigger your conceptual box, demonstrate how we make up our own rules. Most of the rules that you're operating under are not real. You made them up. They're not actually even in the problem. They're just in your brain. And uh, at, by practicing this over and over and over again with a series of exercises like 30 circles, you build the neural connections that seek the aha moment. Because the aha moment versus the stuck moment is terrible. You feel bad. You just want to stop working on the problem and go wash your cat or something. I mean, anything looks better than being stuck. But the, um, but the aha moment, when you have a good idea, that's a completely different moment. When you're in a brain scanner, we see you know, your multi-regions of your brain light up. We see uh, endorphins being released, uh, which are happy chemicals. You know, um, the stress hormones are dropping. The endorphins and happy chemicals are rising. And you have massively engaged brain activity, very high energy brain activity. That feels so good that it's the incentive to get stuck because the aha moment can only come after the stuck moment. So if you if you teach your if you challenge yourself with hard problems, problems that you don't know the answers to, um, and try, challenge yourself over and over and over again, as you have these moments, these aha moments, you're kind of going to get hooked on the happy chemicals, and you're going to want to have more and more of them. But you can't get there until you get stuck. And a lot of times, people don't know what their, their stuck state feels like. They have been working on problems for so long in such a sort of non-generative way that it, it just, you know, they, they try to avoid problems that cause um, that brain behavior. Um, I'm going to argue, go the other way. Get stuck a lot. Get stuck 10 times a day and get unstuck, you know, as many times as you can. More often than not, um, you're, we're just trying to, again, lower your fear of failure um, and, and sort of embracing that if you're going to be a creative person, you have to act like one. A creative person acts like a curious person and takes on problems that they don't know how to solve. Um, number two, uh, teach yourself to brainstorm. Everybody does brainstorming, and most people do um, sort of a truncated version of it. I'm going to argue that brainstorming, you should, when you're brainstorming, think of yourself as like a fantastic jazz musician. Um, if you think about what a brainstorm is, three or four people in a room trying to come up with ideas that none of them have ever thought of before, it's exactly like a jazz uh, uh, combo. You, and and you got to practice this because it makes no more sense to sit in to, uh, you know, you wouldn't sit in with the Miles Davis sextet with these fantastic um, jazz players if you didn't know how to play a saxophone or you didn't know how to play the drums. But what I see over and over again is people sitting down ad hoc with people who've never brainstormed before. They don't follow the rules. They don't frame a good question. They don't warm up first. They don't do any of the activities that we, we teach. And then they say, see, the brainstorm didn't work. And it's like, well, you know, and, and you wouldn't play very much jazz if you'd never picked up a saxophone before. So the mechanics of this are really rather diffi difficult. And even when you get very good at the mechanics, and there's a four-part process we use at the D school, um, that doesn't make great improvisation because truly, like when jazz musicians sit down to play a song they've played before, over and over again, maybe they've played it hundreds of times, their goal is to play it in a way they've never heard before. And how do you do that? How do you do something you've never done before on a regular basis, over and over again, night after night after night? Well, they've trained themselves to be brilliant at improvisation. Improvisation is the skill of inventing in the moment. And here's the problem. It's the, like Malcolm Gladwell's you know, 10,000 hours. Um, most people sit down in there and they don't really practice this, right? You have to practice. Your, your instrument is your brain and you've got to control it. And it doesn't like to do this kind of behavior. It doesn't like to be free and loose in the moment. So everybody thinks they know how to do this, but actually this, this, this notion of intentionally letting go and trying to figure out how in the moment to create something that has never happened before that takes a lot of practice. I would estimate, you know, in our, our work here in school, it takes about 100 hours. 100, I'm teaching a, our first design class. It's called ME 101 Visual Thinking, Experiences in Visual Thinking. And it's about a 100-hour immersion into this process of invention in the moment through both visualization and um, things like brainstorming and mind mapping. 
And it takes about 100 hours to move an engineering student, a very highly trained, very, very smart Stanford engineering student, from completely terrible to OK, from novice to competent in this methodology. And it'll take another 10 times that before they get to a, sort of an expert level of brainstorming. So you have to invest in this because you're, you're literally you're building new neural pathways which allow you to make the connections between disparate information in a nonlinear way. And that's just a fancy way of saying you've got to be able to invent in the moment. You've got to let go. You've got to be able to have the next word. It's a yes and process in brainstorming. And it's really harder to do than people think. And one of the reasons people say brainstorming isn't productive is that it's actually just really bad brainstorming. Um, it's a mind-body problem, right? You've got to be able to control how your whole physiology works in that process. Most people, particularly when they're doing this at the office or at work, they're coming from some kind of a analytical part of their um, day. They've just come from the budget meeting or the schedule meeting or something. And then you say, hey, let's all get together and have great ideas. And it's like, well, that's, you know, my, my, my brain is not in the great idea mode. It's in the budget mode. So you've got to be able to move from the analyst, analysis side to the synthesis side of your thinking. And to do that, you have to warm up. You actually have to move the brain from one state to the other. Um, we use a lot of games that we steal from improv, improv comedy. We have a fantastic class on, on that at Stanford in the uh, drama department. Patricia Ryan um, was the woman who created that whole improv program. We now have Dan Klein and a bunch of other people doing this. Pick up her book, Improv Wisdom. Um, it's not just a, uh, a great book on improvisation. It's a great book on life. But um, we have a, a whole series of warm-up exercises, with stoking exercises, which drive the brain into high-energy brain behaviors and lower the fear of failure and allow people to invent in the moment. And when it works, it is like beautiful music. You watch these teams going, and they're laughing, and they're, and they're inventing. And you know, in a five- or ten-minute brainstorm, they can easily generate a hundred ideas. If you're not if you're not in a brainstorming session that is that fluid and that productive, um, pick up a copy of this book. Learn to warm up first, and and start imagining yourself like a jazz musician. I always tell my students, creativity is just a series of behaviors. If you act like a creative person, you're indistinguishable from one. So we'll just say you are. Um, so you need to act like the kinds of people who can generate a hundred ideas in five minutes. You know. And, um, and it's, a, it's a very exciting one. Once the transformation occurs and you start brainstorming in this modality, it, the, the transformation is very exciting. The other thing is we to typically people, like, um, even if they have a good generative brainstorm, there's 100 Post-its on the wall, and we're all done, they, we go, okay, we're done, and somebody takes a picture of the wall as if that was going to somehow be useful. Uh, and then they're done, and then a week later we go, what, what happened in the brainstorm? I don't know, I took a picture. Uh, I haven't looked at it yet. I mean, I think um, cell phones are where ideas go to die. Um, they're never used. Uh, what you have to do just right after the brainstorm, after you've done this generative, I'm not being critical, we're just having ideas, then you want to do the idea selection and grouping, which is a critical thing. And there, the, the, the simple um, the, the flip that I'd offer you is, don't filter your ideas by things that can be done. Filter your ideas by things that are high potential. Again, it's changing the schema of the sort. Uh, we typically look for ideas that are delightful. That's the one that I, I love to use as a filter. Um, which of the 100 ideas we have on the board here, let's cluster them into groups. Which group is the most? If we could create a solution like this in my own life or for the, for the team, would who would, you know, who would be the most delightful um, uh, solutions to, to look at? And, and that tends to select in a different fashion, which gives you a different sort of pool of ideas to work from. And that's pretty, um, that, that can be pretty trans transformative. And I believe that if you, know, if you brainstorm well, it will transform you. And if you want to transform the team, you got to, or the group, or your relationship, or whatever, you got to transform yourself first. The data shows that novices with a poor setup and follow through brainstorm poorly. Brainstorming is, is in this analogy, like a great jazz ensemble. You have to be expert enough to create in the moment, which means you've got to have at least 100 hours of solid, I mean, good practice. You know, it doesn't, it doesn't do you any good to practice poorly for 100 hours. If you, take a, if you take a golf club and swing it wildly for 100 hours, you don't get to be a better golfer. You need a coach, and you need a trainer, and you need to break it down, and you need to do it right. Um, but if you improve your brainstorming up, 
output, it, you'll get a much richer set of interesting ideas. And if you choose around interesting filters like delightful or entertaining or uh, weirdest, you know, you'll be working with a much uh, richer pool of potential innovations. And so if you want to just do a couple things to make your brainstorms better, warm up with an improv game and select your ideas for potential. The final thing I want to talk to you about and the three things you can do to be more creative, right? We've, we've talked about getting, putting yourself in situations to get stuck, changing the way you brainstorm so you imagine yourself as a brilliant, you know, fluid, inventing in the moment jazz musician. And then I want to talk about space. When people come to the workshops and they say, what's the one thing we can do when we go back to our company? Or what's the one thing I could do to make myself more creative? I go, you've got to give yourself a creative space. Space creates behavior. Here's a picture of a classroom at Stanford. Um, if you were to walk into this room, you would instantaneously, all of you have been students at one time or another, you would instantaneously know exactly what the behavior is that is required. You know, if we were doing a poll, it would be, you know, the answers would be something like, sit down, shut up, take notes, listen to the person at the front of the room, right? This is what we, we derisively call the D School, the sage on stage model of teaching. I'm going to stand in front of a whiteboard or a chalkboard. I'm going to tell you things that you don't know. You're going to write them down, and somehow or other information and knowledge will be transferred. By the way, all the studies of this method, the lecture method of teaching, says it's 20% effective. Uh, and so, frankly, if I had a factory that was making 80% defects, I would just shut it down. I think they should just shut down Stanford and all of the universities because they're making 80% defects. Um, this isn't really the right way to teach, but it, it's an example, and we don't have any classrooms like this at the D school. It's an example of how this space imposes on you behavior. Um, there's a very famous study done at Stanford years ago here called the Stanford Prison Experiment, where they made a little mock prison. It was actually just a couple of rooms in the psychology building. But because the space was created as a coercive environment, people acted the way they would act in a prison. Um, I would argue this, this picture of this lecture room is pretty prison-like in its uh, uniformity and lack of engagement or interaction or radical collaboration. How can you be curious in a room like this? You know, how, how, can, how can you have a bias to action in a room like this? You're not even allowed to stand up. So, you know, we don't have spaces like this, so the guys over at IDEO, which is David's big design firm, probably, you know, the premier design innovation company in the, in the, in the world, um, they have a saying, if you live in a cubicle world, you will think cubicle thoughts. And I think, it, I think it's true. I think it's hard to break out of an environment uh, which doesn't allow for the kinds of behaviors that we're, we're asking you to do. So the creative spaces, this is, a, this is a studio over in the D school. You can see this, everything's on wheels. There's lots of graphics on the walls. There's lots of student work everywhere. Um, we also believe that in the space that you create, you want to have your work up all the time so you can be constantly inspired visually and tactily um, by the work that you're doing. Um, you want to, you want, uh, there's some studies about this in uh, an article in the New Yorker uh, uh, a while back. Um, they talked about how space creates um, innovation in a study of 36,000 scientific papers. The ones ranked most innovative were created in co-locations co-locational environments. In other words, the scientists and the engineers and the business people or whoever, whatever the innovation was, they were all working together in an innovative environment. And a raw or easily modified environment seems to have a high correlation to creativity. There's a building 20 at MIT is famous. It was a building that was built, just thrown up a sort of a prefab construction building thrown up during the war to house some researchers. And then, uh, like any building, like it was supposed to get torn down, but it never got torn down. And it was a kind of the crappy place on campus to work. So people who were weird or different and didn't get the prestigious labs got this lab. And that's where all the innovations from MIT came from. Because and people literally, when they had a piece of equipment and it didn't fit, they just cut a hole in the wall because it wasn't precious and stuck the equipment through the wall. Or they were, they were smashed in together with, you know, a biology professor and his researchers were smashed in with a mechanical engineering professor and his researchers. And the, co the collaboration um, that happened was where the innovation occurred. So space, and particularly not precious space, is critical. Um, 
create a war room or a project room, even if it's in your own home, create a studio. I mean, all artists have studios. What are studios? They're spaces where you can create. Make the information about whatever you're thinking about persistent. Remove all the clues about status and who's more important and stuff. Status creates hierarchy, which creates fear, which defeats creativity. Um, in the D school classrooms, we have no visible hierarchy. There is no stage. There is no front or back to the room. And then this notion of making the room self-authoring, one of the reasons we put everything on wheels is so that the space can be hacked instantaneously. If I need to work on something big and, and long on the wall, I can just push everything out of the way and tape it to the wall. If I need something small and short, I can do it that way. There's more. Uh, we have a book that a couple of guys at the Z School did, Scott and Scott, called Make Space, which will give you some examples of how to um, um, look at your space and make it more creative. And the New Yorker article from the January 30th, 2012, would be interesting reads. My takeaways are, you know, changing yourself and becoming the creative self that is actually inside of you isn't about, you know, adding things as much as it is taking things away. But it is all about changing your behaviors. If you do these three things, challenge yourself with hard problems and get stuck more often. Move to the notion that I am a, I am a musician and my mind is my instrument and I play jazz when I brainstorm and creating some spaces that will demand these kinds of behaviors. You will model the behavior you want, and you will act differently, and you will get different rewards, therefore, from the outside world, and it will become this virtuous cycle of becoming more and more creative. And by the way, to make any change in behavior, the psychologists take, tell us it takes at least eight weeks if you want to change a bad habit or change a, a behavior of yours. It's going to take at least a focused attention for a couple of months you know, in a new space or in something else, so you will not see the change overnight. But it is an additive process, and you will see the change occur again and again. And one of the coolest parts about this is other people will notice it. People will come up to you and say, what's, what's going on? You seem a lot more lively. You seem a lot more curious. You seem a lot more engaged than you used to be. And you'll notice that they notice your, that your behaviors have changed. Gandhi's quote, be the change you want to see in the world, I think applies not just globally, but in, in, fundamentally it's an internal situation. If you want to change the, the way you see the world and the way the world sees you, change your behavior. Traditionally, here, here's a question. Uh, traditional classrooms are linear by design. Is that a yes or no question? Is it a yes or no? I mean, I, I will tell you that at Stanford, uh, we've designed a number of buildings with, this, with um, the notion that we need to accommodate some traditional teaching, but also think a little bit more innovatively about the way we're designing space. Um, so that's one question. I. I think I, I've been on a number of um, design committees that are, are trying to, to address that concern. Um, here, here's, a, here's one, Bill, um, for you. Innovation or creativity is something that flows internally. Can this happen under compulsion? Won't compulsion disrupt this notion of a, a neural organic process? Um, you know, it, it's, it's interesting the question uh, uh, the question poses a couple of assumptions that I'm not sure I, I necessarily agree with. Um, I think our, my, my my thinking lately on this is that um, there is a internal compulsion for everyone to be creative, but not everybody notices it that way. Perhaps as a child, a teacher told you, "Oh, you're not an artist, or you can't sing, or something." Some, somebody somebody shut down a natural curiosity or creativity of yours. And so humans are pretty smart smart organisms. They build great defense mechanisms. They try to avoid pain. They try to maximize pleasure. Um, and if you've been told at any point in time by an authority figure who you you just trusted intrinsically that you weren't creative in whatever way that was conveyed to you, then the impulse for creativity has been twisted into the impulse for self-preservation. I don't do the behaviors that get me exposed, or I don't do the behaviors that in my organization would be laughed at, or would be laughed at in my cultural or social circle. So I think once, uh, once you've learned to manage that fear, then the natural com compulsion for creativity comes out. Um, I think uh, most people report, you know, being in a creative state is like what uh, the psychologist Chuck Mahai called a flow state. You're just working on, all, you're firing on all cylinders. Everything is working. You've lost a sense of time. You look up and it's two o'clock in the morning, and you know, but the, but this essay or this painting or this drawing or this cool marketing strategy pledge you've just created is now complete. And uh, 
there's something about that that is so compelling that once you rediscover that your relationship with your own creativity, um, I do think there's a there, there's a um, a drive towards it. Um, I also think that you know you as adults there's you know t you you need creativity at certain times in your life and other times you just need to execute things. You need to get the job done. I, I can't help but think about Johann Sebastian Bach, who his most creative period was really having to write uh, cantata for every Sunday mass. And if you look back at his work, that's his most creative period. So something about the deliberate compulsion of this uh, Sunday mass. Well, uh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, uh, it's well known that uh, creative people need deadlines, and nothing happens without constraints. Um, and uh, it's uh, it's often true that it's not a linear thing. Like, okay, I've, if I have to write a mass on Sunday, I'll write one fifth of it on Monday, another fifth of it on Tuesday, another fifth of it on Wednesday, and so it doesn't work that way, right? I have no ideas for Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and it comes to me suddenly in a, in a burst. But if you learn to manage that process, and actually learn to give yourself your own constraints, so that, you you know, I want to have something done by, by Sunday, or I want, to, I want to do this, but I want to do it, you know. Often in our projects and classes, we'll give students really, really difficult constraints, like you can only use as one square foot of cardboard, two rubber bands, and a pencil, design a machine, you know, that um, can cross the, the pond at Terman Plaza or design a machine, you know, that illustrates the American dream. Um, but the constraints create the environment that allows creativity to happen. Are there digital tools and techniques that you see that might help foster creativity in this new digital age? You know, there's not there's there's not too much out there. Um, I'm not a fan of most of the mind mapping software because I think by the time you go to the digital domain, you've lost the sort of fluidity of sort of drawing and, and, and ideating. Um, there are um, I think the, lots of the sort of social media tools. Uh, uh, we use a lot of Instagram. We use a lot of um, um, just you know uh, digital chat environments create collaboration, create instant visualization. You know, sending something, somebody a picture of what I mean or sending a picture of my sketch is a much more dynamic way of sharing information than trying to explain things in text. So those things work. Um, I've got some students working on some tools to um, augment brainstorming across you know, teams that are geographically far flung, but are, that could brainstorm and do things instantaneously. Those, those aren't quite out of the lab yet, but that we're working on that kind of stuff. Uh, in general, um, you know, human creativity and behavior is a pretty analog thing, um, uh, but we, you know, we are working on uh, taking a lot of the, the, the core skills training around these behaviors and putting them online. So we'll be flipping classrooms, and, uh, and there is actually an online version of the IMS class um, from a few years back, and we'll probably be updating that in the future as well. Mm -hmm. So uh, I also got clearly that if you're going to use your cell phone, make sure to take the picture, send it along, and do something with it. Don't want, ideas yeah. don't go to die on cell phones, I heard. Well, Bill, thank you so much for a terrific session. We hope that this has been inspiring to those of you who are still on the line. Thank you for hanging with us. Um, we will certainly send out the additional information if you're interested. And this concludes our webinar. Uh, we wish you a very good day wherever you are. Thank you so much.